Hello and welcome to today's webinar on understanding the medical device classification system from basics to beyond using classification to your competitive advantage. My name is Jessica Lyons, Senior Medical Device Guru here at Greenlight Guru and I will be your moderator for today's event. We've got a really special presentation scheduled for you today. I know our presenter Mike Drews is really looking forward to sharing his valuable insights and expertise on the medical device classification system with creative, provenly effective strategies you'll be able to implement today for a successful regulatory submission to bring your device to market. Before we dive too deep into today's presentation and introduce our presenter and his consultancy, Vascular Sciences, I'm gonna to touch on a few items really quickly. First, today's webinar is gonna run for about 90 minutes in total, which will include a Q&A session at the end where Mike has been kind enough to answer your questions. So I encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar as they come up in the box on the right side, and we will get to as many of them as time permits. I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on these free training sessions. If you've been on one of our training sessions before, then you know we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight Guru, likely a similar mission as many of you on today's webinar. Anything we can do as an organization that helps device makers bring safer, life-changing devices to market quicker and with less, less risk aligns with that mission. We're constantly looking for ways to fulfill that mission, whether it's through hosting these free training sessions, through partnering with world-class medical device consultants like today's presenter, Mike Drews, or through award-winning medical device quality management system software. If you'd like to learn more about why medical device companies from across the globe are moving away from paper-based, general purpose quality management systems and adopting our purpose-built medical device quality management software, I encourage you to head on over to www.greenlight.guru after today's presentation to schedule your free personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. In doing so, you'll learn how the very best medical device companies are leveraging our purpose-built quality management software to gain ISO 13485-2016 certification, market approval, breeze through audits, and push beyond just compliance to produce true quality medical devices. So if you're interested in learning how we can help your device company, make sure you visit www.greenlight.guru after today's webinar and schedule your personalized demo. Now, on to the bulk of today's presentation. Let me give a proper introduction to your presenter today and a distinguished partner of ours here at Greenlight Guru, Mike Drews. Michael Drews is, a, is president of Vascular Sciences, a consulting and training company offering a broad range of services to medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotechnology companies, including creative regulatory strategy and competitive regulatory intelligence, regulatory submission design, FDA presentation preparation and defense. Dr. Drews is an internationally recognized expert who brings a breadth of knowledge and hands-on experience in his teachings from the ongoing work he does for FDA, Health Canada, and other regulatory and governmental agencies around the world. He's also a featured keynote speaker on cutting edge medical technologies and regulatory affairs. If any of you are familiar with the Global Medical Device Podcast, you'll recognize his voice right away as he's a longtime frequent guest on the show. So without further ado, let me hand it over to your presenter, Mike Drews. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for that very kind introduction. I want to thank you and my many friends at Greenlight for the opportunity to have this uh, put on this webinar today. And obviously, a special thanks to all of those in the audience, both those that are listening live right now, as well as those that might be listening in the future for the recording, because without you all, we would just be wasting our time. So as Jessica mentioned, the subject of today's webinar is medical device classification. And uh, I really want to take this above and beyond just sort of the basics of classification. Yes, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, exactly what classification is and why it's important. But I really want to take it beyond that. I have a number of case studies that I want to share with you. I'm going to put in here as many as I possibly can um, of actual medical devices. One of my frustrations with a lot of folks that do presentations like these is they talk in very high-level platitudes and generalities, and rarely ever do they use specific examples. 
On the contrary, I'm going to take the opposite approach, and I'm going to use a lot of very specific examples. Some of the devices that I'm going to share with you today, I've been involved with personally. Others I have not. But just like uh, in medicine, I believe in taking the case study approach as opposed to reading uh, the regulation to you, which all of you, you know, you've graduated from elementary school. You know how to read. You can, you can read it. I don't need to read it to you. So what I want to uh, cover as best as I can in the short time that we do have today is what is the medical device classification system? Why do we have one? How do we determine the class of our device? Can we change the classification of our device? Um, most importantly is how can we use classification to our advantage? Uh, how does labeling and risk influence classification? Can the same medical device be classed at multiple levels at the same time? In other words, can it be what I call class zero? FDA does not use that phrase, by the way, but I do class zero for wellness devices, class one, class two, or class three, uh, all at the same time. Um, and uh, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'll talk a tiny bit about how classification varies in other parts of the world, but that could be the, the topic of a, of a completely different webinar, which perhaps I'll do in the future. So let's start out with the very first question before getting into classification, what it is, why is classification important? Why is this something that we even need to know about? Well, there are a number of reasons. One of them is that depending on the class of our device, that will, that will determine what pathway to market options that we have. In other words, here we have what I call my medical device pyramid. This was presented in my Pathways to Market webinar that I did for Greenlight a couple of months ago. Um, I would encourage you, I think that's my next slide actually, uh, if you're not familiar with all of the different pathways to market that we have for medical devices, and believe me, there are a lot of them, many, many more than most people think, I would encourage you to take a look at this webinar, which is available through Greenlight On Demand. So, um, hey, Mike, you... um, it appears that we have a minor issue with the sharing in terms of the slides. Um, we've just had a couple of people uh, who are asking um, if they are able to see things. Um, so, a uh, quick question on the audience. Are you guys able to see the slides? Um, I don't know if this is isolated to one or two people uh, or if this is something. Okay, so yes, uh, it looks like um, almost everyone can. We've just got a couple who can't, so I will work with them individually. Thank you guys so much for letting us know. Uh, apologize for interrupting, but I did not want you guys to miss this. No, I appreciate that, Jessica. Uh, if there's something that I need to do on my end to fix that problem, let me know. But I would assume if the most people can see it, then I hope it's not a problem with my end. And for yeah. those of you that can't see the slides right now, um, as Jessica mentioned at the beginning, this is being recorded, so you might want to, you know, watch the, the first few minutes of it again. And there will be a handout available uh, after the webinar with all of these slides. So um, never fear that information is going to be available to you, if not now, then in the future. Anyway, uh, coming back to where I left off, the reason why, one of the reasons why classification is important is because it will determine what our potential pathway to market options are uh, f uh, for our medical device here in the in the United States. In other words, as you see at the bottom of my, my pyramid, this is where we find what I call the class zero. Again, FDA doesn't use that phrase, but I do. The class zero medical devices. These are what we call the wellness devices. These are not regulated in any way, shape, or form by FDA. Uh, and for those that are interested, I did a, a webinar for Greenlight some, some time ago on uh, wellness devices and the wellness exemption, so that's available on demand through the Greenlight website as well. One level above the wellness devices are the class one or class two exempt devices. Exempt in this context means there's no 510K or de novo that's required. They're they are regulated by the FDA, but at a very low level. In other words, you still have to have a quality management system. You still, in most cases, have to be following design controls. You still have to be FDA registered, but there's no 510K or de novo or PMA or any formal review of the device. One level above that, of course, is the class one and class two non-exempt devices. This is where a 510K or de novo would be required. And then finally, at the apex of the pyramid, uh, we have the class three 
devices, which are usually PMAs, pre-market approvals, or HDEs, humanitarian device exemption, the, um, the medical device equivalent of the orphan drug program. Okay, again, for those that are not familiar with all of these options, and by the way, there are several other options, other pathways to market that you do not see on this pyramid. I highly encourage you to take a look at that pathways to market uh, um, webinar that I did for, for Greenlight uh, that I mentioned a moment ago. Okay, so why do we have a medical device classification system and why is it unique to medical devices? In other words, we do not have a similar system for drugs and biologics. Perhaps we should. That's a topic of a different discussion. But classification, that the, the classification system is unique to medical devices. And the question is why? Remember, it's not sufficient to simply understand what the regulation says. Anybody that's graduated from elementary school can read what the regulation says. That's the easy part. We really need to try to understand why it says what it says. In other words, the intent of that regulation, or what I like to call the regulatory logic, in order to use it uh, to, to, to our advantage. So why do we have a medical device classification system, and why is it unique to devices as opposed to, to drugs and biologics? The answer is very simple. In the medical device world, we have a very, very broad range of products. In other words, on one end of the spectrum, we have things like Band-Aids and EKG monitors and wheelchairs. All the way through to, to the other end of the spectrum, we have things like totally implantable artificial hearts. And it should not take an MD or a PhD or an RAC after somebody's name to appreciate that, gee, maybe it doesn't make sense to hold a Band-Aid to the same level of scrutiny in terms of benchtop testing, animal testing, clinical testing, and so on, that we would for an artificial heart. So the reason why we have a classification system for devices and the reason why it's unique to devices is to allow us to do what I call stratification of risk. In other words, we do not treat all medical devices as if they are the same. We, we divide them, we stratify them into layers based on risk. At least that's what the theory says, but there are a ton of exceptions. Remember, average regulatory professionals know the rules. The best regulatory professionals know the exceptions. And I'm going to share with you uh, perhaps one or two exceptions uh, as we continue on here. Speaking of risk, how do we handle risk in medical devices? For those of you that don't know me in this audience, uh, let me just mention quickly that I happen to be a subject matter expert for the FDA in several different areas, one of them being risk. So this is an area where I do spend a fair of my time fair amount of my time uh, uh, working. Well, there are three independent but also interdependent systems uh, that we use here in the U.S. to try to deal with work risk. The first, which is the subject, of course, of today's webinar, is the classification system, class one, class two, class three. A second risk system is the non-significant risk, or NSR, versus significant risk, or SR, system. Now, I don't have time to talk about that in detail. Suffice it to say, the most important reason why we need to consider that is when we do a clinical trial. If a, if a medical device is a non-significant risk device, then a, an IDE, an investigational device exemption, is not required. Uh, whereas if it's a significant risk device, an IDE is required. There are other reasons why NSR and SR are important, but for the sake of time, I'll leave it at, at that one. It's, it's important in the context of medical device clinical trials. And then the third way that we deal with risk is the software medical device classification system. Now, I am not talking about software as medical devices, SAMDs here. I'm talking about software uh, across the board. This is where we have class A, class B, and class C. Again, I don't have time to, to get into that in detail. I'll show you uh, uh, a resource on that in a moment. But to be honest, and, and like I said, I'm a subject matter expert for FDA on risk. I don't think we can make this any more complicated than if we tried, right? I don't think there's any reason why we need multiple systems um, for dealing with, with risk, but that's a, a topic of a, of a different discussion. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention is there's no easy way, there's no conversion factor, if you will, to be able to move from be between each of these different classification systems. That's why I'm saying they're independent, but also they're interdependent. So um, I, perhaps in a, in a webinar in the future, I can go into the other, way, the other uh, ways that we deal with risk uh, in more detail. Uh, if you want more specifically on risk, 
uh, I would point you to the webinar that I did for Greenlight a couple of years ago now, specifically on risk, what I call the many connotations of the risk and the consequences of getting them wrong. Suffice it to say, as an SME on risk, I have said to the FDA many times that I'm not keen on any of the common approaches to risk, including the ISO standard. Um, I think they're woefully inadequate, to say it politely. And uh, so several years ago, I developed my own sort of approach, what I call my free bucket approach to risk. Some of you in the audience might be familiar with that. And I'm proud to say that that is now being adopted by uh, FDA. It's, it's being accepted in, in medical device submissions, although they refuse to give me credit for it, but that's, uh, that's a topic of a different discussion. So I mentioned the software classification system. Here's just one quick slide on that. Class A, Class B, and Class C, uh, depending on the, the level of harm, uh, Class A would be the lowest level where no injury or damage to, the, to health is possible. <laughs> That's a pretty absolute statement, but uh, anyway, Class B is kind of in the middle, and then Class C, of course, uh, you know, death or serious injury is possible. But again, uh, not to, not to um, get into this in too much detail here, it's not nearly as simple as, uh, as this particular slide um, uh, uh, presents it. But it, I, I just wanted to introduce you to it, at least for those of you that are not familiar very much with, uh, with, with software and, and risk. Okay, so let's come back to the, um, to the topic of today's webinar, which of course is classification, class one, two, and three. So this is a, a slide that I stole from FDA's website many, many years ago. Another reason why classification is important, I said earlier, is because it will determine your pathway to market options, 510K, PMA, and so on. Uh, another reason why it's important is from a pragmatic perspective, it will determine what level of regulation we're, we're um, expected to follow. In other words, for the lowest risk devices, these follow what we call the general controls. These are the most basic controls, okay? This is all what I call basic engineering. Like, for example, if you have an electrical device like a telemetry monitor or something like that, being able to plug it into the wall without somebody getting electrocuted. I would like to think that we would not have to have regulation like that. I would like to think that we would not need somebody like the SDA to tell people to do that kind of thing. I would like to think that that's basic engineering, that stuff that we used to teach in engineering school. I'm not sure if we still do. But all of that is under the the general controls. One level up from that is the class two devices. They're still uh, subject to the general controls, but now we have the special controls that kick in as well. Now, let's just go into that in a, a tiny bit more detail because did you ever think about that phrase, special controls? What the heck does special mean? This is not everybody shows up to gets a, gets a trophy. Uh, there, there, there's nothing special about these controls. Instead, what we should call them is are the specific controls because as the class increases from class one to class two, and then as we'll talk about in a moment from class two to class three, the complexity, the technology of the device typically increases. The um, pathophysiologies typically increase. The comorbidities tend to increase. So it's not possible to simply have general regulation that covers these higher class devices. Instead, the regulation becomes more specific. Not special, again, there's nothing special about it, but more specific. And then finally, we get to class three, where we still have the general controls, uh, and this is where we get usually into the PMA. Uh, but this is where I call we have the, the more specific controls. Um, because again, as the class increases, the technology usually increases and, uh, and so on. And so it makes more, it makes sense to have that regulation become more specific, more detailed and so on. But again, this is theory. Reality is far more complex. We're going to take a look at some examples uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, here's just another way to say the same thing. This is from the FDA, um, where they kind of, you know, describe class one, class two, and class three, and give some examples. Nothing wrong with this, but I find it just very, very general, almost to the point of being insulting to uh, to a reasonable person's intelligence. That's why I want to go on and, and look at some examples that are not quite so so straightforward as that. Starting with this one. Let's take a look at um, hospital beds. Is a hospital bed a medical device? And if so, what class is it? Well, believe it or not, not only is a hospital bed a medical device, it's often regulated as a class two medical device. In other words, we're putting it in the, uh, in the middle 
uh, risk budget bucket when it comes to classification. I'll talk more about that in uh, in just a moment. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Well, before we talk about hospital beds, how about a regular bed, the bed that you sleep in in your house? Is a regular bed a medical device? Well, most people say, oh my God, Mike, what a wackadoodle question. How could anybody ask such a, such a stupid question? Well, before you think that, uh, let me share with you a uh, commercial from, uh, from Jordan's Furniture, a furniture store where I used to live back in the Boston area. Watch this. You know the mattresses help with back pain, but they've changed so much in the last eight years, they can help you with your hip, your shoulder, or your knee. Or if you have fibromyalgia, allergies, or arthritis. And right now, everything at Jordan's, including mattresses, is available with 60 months, no interest financing. Okay, I want to play just those last few seconds again, and I want you to pay particularly close attention to the claims. Listen to the claims that they're, they're making. Here it is once more with your hip, your shoulder, or your knee, or if you have fibromyalgia, allergies, or arthritis. Okay, he's making two sets of claims. The first set, helping with your hip, your shoulder, and your knee. From a regulatory perspective, those claims don't bother me at all because they're very nonspecific. What the heck does, does you know helping you with your hip even mean? I have absolutely no idea. That is not a problem. The second set of claims that he makes, fibromyalgia and... Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I forgot the other couple, but now he's making disease-specific claims. And from a regulatory perspective, this is where it really gets interesting because one of the things that influences your classification are your claims, your labor. And this is exactly why I alluded to a few minutes ago, we can have one medical device that is on the market, say, under the wellness exemption, the class zero, a second medical device, exactly the same device that's on the market as, say, a class one exempt, a third version of that exact same device that's on the market as, say, a class two or 510K, a fourth version of exactly the same device as a class two de novo, and in some, albeit extreme examples, a fifth version of exactly the same device that's a class three that's a PMA. And when I say exactly the same, I literally mean exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the claims, is the labeling, what we what we say about the device. So that's just one of the important factors that goes into uh, the classification determination. Um, and uh, um, again, I'm going to skip this one for the sake of time. Let's go to uh, this next slide. Um, so if a hospital bed is a medical device, how about the rails on the bed? Um, well, it turns out that it depends on what you say about them. The rails on the bed may or may not be considered a medical device depending on whether the manufacturer makes a specific claim. In other words, the, uh, if you say the device will keep a dementia or an Alzheimer's patient from falling out of the bed, that would make it a regulated medical device. On the other hand, if you don't make such a claim, then it would be viewed simply as a consumer product. So yeah, the technology is important, what the device does, how it works, but just as important as the technology are the claims in the classification determination. Um, and so taking this just a little bit further, uh, is a wheelchair a medical device? Absolutely. How about a cushion? on the wheelchair of the medical device. Well, some of you might not think so, but if that's the case, how do we explain this? This particular company got a warning letter from the FDA because they were, um, uh, among other things, advertising their wheelchair cushions as reducing causes of skin tissue trauma. Reducing causes of skin tissue trauma. That's a pretty specific claim. Without going to the FDA, you are taking a regulatory risk, as this company did, by getting smacked. How can you avoid that? It could have easily been avoided. 100% predictable, 100% preventable. Don't make such a specific claim like reducing causes of uh, skin tissue trauma. Instead, dumb your claim down a little bit. In other words, say that um, you know it makes your tushy feel better or something like that. So it's all in the wording here. It's uh, the, the, the claims, the labeling, it's all in the wording or what I like to call the wordsmithing. Um, 
again, I'm, I'm going to go to the next example for the sake of time. How do we determine the classification of my medical device? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, in which uh, bin should the tongue depressor go? Class one, class two, class three. But it's not nearly as simple as that. So let's take a look at um, what the FDA's website says. Uh, the first step in is asking the question, is the product a medical device? Well, I would uh, put a small modification on that product, uh, on that question rather. The best question to ask is, is it a regulated medical device? Because if it's not a regulated medical device, as I said earlier, a class zero device, a wellness device, then the answer to the classification qu uh, question is a moot point. But assuming that it is a regulated medical device, then the next question is, what is the classification and how is it determined? Well, the short answer to every question in regulatory affairs, there are no exceptions, is it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on, first, is it an existing device or is it a new device? Let's be honest, the vast majority of you in this audience are working on Me Too devices, existing devices. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just what the, what our industry is primarily built on. And when you're working on an existing device, usually, not always, but usually, the classification of your device defaults to the classification of the previous device, if it's a, if it's a predicate device, for example. That's not always the case, but often it is. On the other hand, if it's a totally new and novel device, then classification has not been determined yet. And now this is where life really gets interesting because you get an opportunity, as I'll talk about later, to influence the FDA to say, here's our new device. There isn't anything out there like it yet. We're the first ones. And it's a class one, and here's why, or it's a class two, and here's why, or it's a class three, and here's why. Most of you are probably not going to have the opportunity to do it, but because you know, a, a part of my business is involved with uh, working on truly new or novel devices, devices that are not Me Too's. That's something that I, I really enjoy. So as an example, let's take a look at this next one. Is a ringtone a medical device? The ringtone that you have on your phone, uh, is that a medical device? Most people would probably say probably not. But remember, average regulatory professionals know the rules. The best ones know the exceptions. Can a ringtone be a medical device? Well, what if I have a ringtone that can tell you that you're having a heart attack? I'm not going to take the time to show you the video on that, but we have that technology right now. This is a, a technology that I was involved with a number of years ago. You can basically connect this ringtone to a, a type of in vitro diagnostic, which will detect whether a patient is having a heart attack or better is going to have a heart attack in the future and sends a signal to the um, to the patient's cell phone warning them that hey you might have a heart attack pretty soon in that play in that case it's definitely a medical device so the question is what class is it what risk risk is it we have for example uh, EKG monitors that now are cell phone based right and so um, the question is What's the class of that? If we were bringing that um, EKG monitor that runs on an app on your cell phone, um, would that be class one, class two, class three? Well, usually, and this is the simplest answer, I wish we had more time to get into this in more detail, usually the class will default to the predicate. In this particular case, it really doesn't matter if the EKG is running on a cell phone or in a standalone box, uh, EKG telemetry uh, box that we've been using, you know, for, for decades. So in that particular case, it makes sense. If we go to FDA's website, you can easily find out that these kinds of, uh, of of software apps are 510k class 2 but when you go to the FDA's website it'll tell you the answer but it will never tell you why and this is another thing that I get frustrated with a lot of peaceables approach because if I say to you for example that an EKG app is a class 2 510k you might say gee that's interesting but what have you learned absolutely nothing because what happens, because that's like, you know, if I say 1 plus 1 equals 2, but what happens in the future when somebody asks you what is 2 plus 3 or 5 plus 7 and so on? So what is much more important than the answer that it's 510K class 2 is the is the logic, is the regulatory logic that we use to get there. Um, is this based on substantial equivalence? Well, partly, but also it's based on risk as well. That's where the, the classification ties in. And I mentioned um, 
a moment ago the EKG app which we can run on the phone. Now we actually have products to do that. Uh, here's the indication use for use statement for one of them. Uh, it's intended to record, store, and transfer single elect single channel electrocardiogram uh, rhythms. Um, it also displays ECG rhythms, so that's all, you know, we've been doing that for decades, but we're now adding some complexity to it. It detects the presence of atrial fibrillation, or AFib. That's taking this a step further. Now we're starting to get into the area of the practice of medicine, which many people say, many regulatory professionals and all the regulatory textbooks say, FDA doesn't regulate the practice of medicine which is true, but the textbook is never complete. There's an important caveat that goes on to that. FDA doesn't regulate the practice of medicine when it's practiced by a person, by a physician, by a surgeon, by a nurse, a pharmacist, in this case, maybe a cardiologist. But when the practice of medicine is being practiced by a device like it is here, now FDA is all over it. So <clears throat> to bring an EKG, a, a straight up vanilla flavored EKG monitor onto the market, whether it's in a, on a cell phone app or not, that's an easy thing to do. That's a no brainer. If you're going to now start to include, maybe via some artificial intelligence or something like that, the ability to detect arrhythmias like AFib or the branch block or something else, you can still bring it onto the market, don't worry about it, but you are going to have a higher regulatory burden because now your device is practicing a medicine. Could this same device be a wellness device? Again, I did a webinar on the on wellness device the exemption for, for um, green light. You should check it out if you're interested. But the reason why I bring it up here is because look at the tail end of the indication for use statement. It says, for patients with known or suspected heart conditions and health conscious individuals. A health conscious individual smacks to me as a wellness device. So it is possible to bring a device like this onto the market without any oversight by the FDA. I'm not suggesting that we should do that, but the way that the indication for use statement is written, it's a definite possibility. Okay, let's um, continue on and take a look at some other examples. And Jessica, this is the polling question that I had uh, talked to you about earlier. Let's take a look at a scalpel. Everybody knows what a scalpel is. What I'd like to ask the audience is, how do you think a scalpel is regulated? What is the class? And on the screen, you have four, uh, five options. Class zero, class one, class two, class three, or it depends. So let's just take a couple of seconds, Jessica, if those in our audience can just click one of those options. Uh, I'd be real curious to see what our audience thinks. Yep, uh, so it looks like we're at about half the audience voting right now. So uh, just a, a second or two to get a couple more people in there. And okay, here we go. So uh, it looks like we had 1% say class zero, 24% said class one, 13% said class two, 5% said class three, and 56% have obviously been attending quite a few of your webinars and regulatory discussions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Jessica, Jessica for, her, for sharing uh, those results. Yeah, it's interesting. We have a, a pretty broad spectrum across, the, across that continuum. Well, the short answer is it does depend. Uh, and there is nobody on earth, including the FDA, that can answer this question simply based on the information that I've provided. Why? Because I haven't told you anything about the labeling, about the uh, indications for use or the intended use. This particular example is right off of FDA's website. So what does, what does classification depend on? It depends on the labeling. I'm going to come back to that in a second. It also comp uh, depends on the risk. Now, again, there are a litany of connotations of risk. I'm not going to get into the details of those right now. but what I want to talk about here is the labeling of the scalpel. As I said, the short answer, it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on the intended use. So if we go into the FDA with a very general claim like cutting tissue, then for those of you that answered class one, you will be correct. On the other hand, if we change our labeling, we change our intended use, we don't change anything about the scalpel. 
the physical design, the materials, the, the, the dimensions and so on are exactly the same, but we just simply change what we say. For example, this, this scalp is now indicated for corneal incisions and ophthalmological surgery in the eye. That exact same scalpel becomes class three. Now, I don't think it should take uh, an MD or a PhD or an RAC after somebody's name to appreciate that. Gee, there's a pretty di big difference between um, class one, class three, just depending on the words that we use, which kind of begs the question, you know, how would we advertise this? You know, would our company, if we wanted to come out with a scalpel that was indicated for use in the, in the cornea, would we do that? Well, you could do that, but now you're looking at a class three PMA. The much, mm, I don't want to say easier, but another strategy is to bring it onto the market as a class one with a, with a general indication like cutting tissue and then somehow encourage, mm, suggest, uh, you know, how it might be used in other places in the body, including in the eye. This is now we're getting into the area of off-label use, and so many people think you cannot advertise off-label use. That is what all the regulatory textbooks say. That is what virtually all the regulatory professionals say. The only problem is they're flat out wrong. You can legitimately advertise off-label use. In fact, FDA has put out three guidances. There's a fourth one that's going to be coming out. It's been delayed a little bit because of COVID, specifically telling people on how you advertise off-label use. I don't have time to talk about that here, but the only thing that I would say is this. I don't want anybody to leave this webinar today, go back to the company and say, hey, I heard this webinar by this wackadoodle tools guy, and he said that we can now start advertising the off-label use of our products. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you are going to advertise the off-label use, or if you're considering advertising off-label use, then for those of you that remember the Bugs Bunny cartoon, the, the um, character uh, Elmer Fudd, be very, very careful because if you screw this up, and unfortunately some companies do screw this up, you might not be dealing just with the FDA, you might find yourself dealing with the FBI. And if you think the FDA is difficult to deal with, they certainly can be, but they're nothing compared to the Department of Justice. Those folks don't miss around. So you can uh, bring a scalpel onto the market as a class one, and then somehow encourage people to use it in other places in the body, like the eye, or alternatively, you could bring it on as a class three. But the reason why I'm bringing it up here is it's a terrific example, just one of many examples, how the labeling, specifically the intended use, will influence the classification of your device. This is the tagline uh, from uh, a book that's um, one of my many regulatory mantras. It's not what you say that matters, it's what people hear. It's not what you say that matters, it's what people hear. Politicians are very good at this. Good regulatory professionals are also very good at this. Unfortunately, there are a lot of average regulatory professionals out there, not a lot of good ones. All right, let's take a look at a few other examples to try to further illustrate the subtleties of the classification world, starting out with this particular medical device called the Zona Plus. For those that are not familiar, I'm going to show you their, their commercial. And while you're thinking, while you're watching this commercial, I want you to think about how would you bring this onto the market? What would be the classification? Would it be any of the options that you see on the screen right now? Watch this. Maintaining healthy blood pressure and good cardiovascular health is difficult, especially as you get older. I know from experience. That is, until I discovered the Zona Plus. The Zona Plus is an all-natural isometric therapy device that helps your body maintain a healthy cardiovascular system. This simple process only takes 12 minutes a day, and you can do it almost anywhere. These days, I'm finding that life is a lot more about what I can do instead of what I can't. The Zona Plus is intended to help you manage your cardiovascular fitness and is not indicated for the treatment or prevention of any disease. If you use medication to reduce blood pressure, the use of the Zona Plus may result in low blood pressure. If you experience the symptoms of low blood pressure, you should contact your physician right away, as your medications may need to be adjusted. To take control of your cardiovascular health, try the Zona Plus. Risk-free. Okay, you get the idea. Now, for the sake of time, we don't have to, uh, we don't have time to talk about the technology of this device, which was which would clearly uh, influence our classification determination as well. But let's just use this focus on the labeling 
for this particular device based on what you just heard in that ad, what would be the classification? And I, we could have done this as a as a polling question. Perhaps I, I should have, but I, I didn't. Uh, well, the short answer is it depends. So what does it depend on? Once again, let's dig into this a little bit further. Let's uh, take a look at what they say about the product. This is from the company's website, website, and I think they mentioned this in the in the DTP ad that I just showed you. It aids in the improvement of cardiovascular health. That is a very nebulous, very non-specific label claim, right? Notice they're not saying anything about uh, measuring your blood pressure or controlling blood pressure or reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease or anything like that. They're simply saying improving your cardiovascular health. So by that logic, we could easily come up with a justification to bring this onto the market under the wellness exemption as a class zero device because we're not making a specific medical claim. But in this particular case, the company did not do that. In this particular case, uh, again, uh, on, this is from the, the company's website. The Zona Plus is in a category of medical devices that do not require FDA re uh, approval. What they're referring to there is a 510K or de novo or PMA. But it, uh, they, according to the company, it does have to be listed by the FDA for quality control purposes. Basically, what they're saying is this is a class one exempt device. That's code speak for class one exempt. Remember, um, class one exempt means you still have to have a QMS, you still have to have design controls most of the time, you still have to be FDA registered, um, but there is no 510K or, or PMA involved. And in fact, if we go to the product code for this particular device, we see that it is uh, class one. Uh, as you see on the screen uh, in the in the middle of the screen again this is from the uh, from the registration uh, uh, CDRH registration database um, but w what is the product code yeah, uh, uh, if you if you go to the product code description for uh, for BXP it specifically says submission, submission type 510k exempt so this is an example of the, the second layer in my medical uh, device pyramid that I showed you at the beginning, where we have the class one or class two uh, exempt devices. Um, so this is this is still regulated by the FDA as a class one, but it's class one exempt. The question is, does it have to be that way? Absolutely not, because as I showed you a moment ago, this could easily have been brought onto the market without any oversight from the FDA if we stick strictly to those dumbed down label claims that I talked about earlier. So is class one exempt the only correct answer? You know, so many people ask me, you know, what is the what is the 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 one way or the best way to bring our medical device onto the market, what class and what pathway? That's never a black and white question. I would challenge anybody to give me any example of any medical device that could be brought onto the market in only one, using only one class or using only one pathway. In the almost 30 years I've been playing this game, uh, I have never seen that to be the case. And so we have multiple choices here. Depending on our claims, the technology can be exactly the same. But depending on the claims, we have the full spectrum. Uh, of, of, of claims. And another thing that I would just point out, you know, a difference in my approach to playing this game to, compared to so many others, is that I refuse to play the, the regulatory police. Let's be honest, in many organizations, regulatory is viewed as the police because they're constantly telling R&D and manufacturing and so on what they cannot do. Uh, and, uh, and I refuse to take that approach. Instead, I pride myself on giving the company the options, usually multiple options of what they can do. And when it comes to labeling, a lot of my regulatory friends will say, you cannot say this. I take the opposite approach. I say to companies all the time, you can say anything you want. You can claim anything. And I literally mean anything you want uh, about your medical device with one important caveat, and that is you need to be able to prove it. So if you want, I'm going to take an extreme example here, but if you want to make the claim, my medical device, whether it's Zona Plus or anything else, cures cancer and regrowth missing limbs, great. Then the first thing that you need to be able to show me is the evidence that you have to support that claim. So you can say anything that you want as long as you can prove it. Bottom line, we always have multiple choices. Uh, and one of the things that's going to defect, sorry, one of the things that's going to affect 
the classification and ultimately the pathway to market option is our labeling, is our our claims. Let's take a look at uh, another example. How about a video game? Can a video game, uh, well, first of all, what is the classification of the video game? And some of you think, oh my God, this guy Drew's, it must be wackadoodle. How could a video game be a regulated medical device? Well, for those that don't think, that don't think it can, not so fast. Any of you are familiar with a, a product that just came onto the market last month, actually two months ago, called Endeavor RX? Watch this. All right, the root suit up. Make way into the network. Okay, you get the idea. So, uh, <clears throat> how can this be a regulated medical device? And assuming it is a regulated medical device, what would be the class? <clears throat> well, long story short, this particular product is being indicated for ADHD. And as a result, this company first, a couple of months ago, they got an EUA, an emergency use authorization, and then they followed that with a de novo. This de novo was just issued by FDA just a few weeks ago. So this is sort of hot off the press. So the, uh, the idea that a video game cannot be a medical device, and in this particular case, a class two medical device, uh, is, is not far-fetched. Uh, here's an example of, 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 uh, of, um, of it right now. How about uh, a refrigerator? What is the classification of a refrigerator? Once again, can a refrigerator be a regulated medical device? Well, the first question we ask is, um, depends on what you put in it. If you put your groceries in it, a refrigerator is not obviously going to be a regulated medical device. On the other hand, what if the refrigerator is intended to store blood? In that particular case, it is regulated as a medical device. Um, could you store blood in your refrigerator at home? Obviously, yes, if you wanted to. But from a regulatory perspective, that would be off-label use. And so that would be out of FDA's bailiwick. But let's come back to the more legitimate example of a refrigerator intended to store blood. Here we see the product code for that particular type of device, KSE. This is a class two device. It's not class one, it's class two, but it is a uh, an exception to the rule. What I mentioned earlier, uh, class one and class two exempt devices. Most class one devices are exempt, but some are not. So let me say that again. Most class one devices are exempt, but some are not. When it comes to class two devices, most class two devices are non-exempt, meaning that they need a 510K or de novo, but some class two devices, granted not many, but some of them are exempt. And here's an example of that. Here we have an example of a class two device that is 510K exempt. Okay, so the next question is why? Once again, as I said earlier, the regulation reading FDA's website, it'll tell you what the regulation says, but rarely, if ever, does it say why. What's the reason for this? Well, here's the product code description. A blood refrigerator and a blood storage freezer, freezer are, devi are devices intended for medical purposes that are used to preserve blood and blood products by storing them at cold or freezing temperatures. The reason why this is class two, but still not exempt, is because of what is in the bottom part of that red box. Uh, and that is the special controls that are necessary uh, to make sure that this particular refrigerator works properly. In other words, that you need to make sure that you need to, that you um, maintain the proper temperature, that you have backups in place in case you have a power failure and so on and so on. The general controls under class one are not specific enough. Notice I'm not saying special enough because there's nothing special about them. They're not specific enough to adequately handle the risk that would be posed with a refrigerator intended to store blood. That is the exact reason. In other words, it's the engineering reasons why this particular device is class two, meaning that we, we have to follow these special control, these uh, specific controls rather, but at the same time, a 510K is not necessary, okay? So that's the regulatory logic to support that. And if you go to uh, product code KSE, this is from the 510K, 
state, 510K database, you'll see there's about 40 devices in this particular area that are class two, but are 510K exempt, as I, um, as I mentioned a moment ago. One more example that I want to share with you, and then we're going to get back to some of the classification basics. Uh, what can happen when you get classification wrong? Well, sometimes it can be a very expensive lesson to be learned. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a device called the Willow Curve. For those of you that are not, let me show you their direct patient ad. Watch this. Are you considering shoulder or knee surgery? Please, pay close attention. Because this device, the Willow Curve, has helped save people from invasive surgery, like knee replacement. The Curve is a non-prescription, non-invasive, drug-free device that is proven to relieve pain, swelling, and stiffness in minutes. It's similar to technologies used in clinics across the country, except you use the Curve in your own home. Simply put it on the painful area, push a button, and let the device relieve your pain. Surgery is not guaranteed, it's risky, and it may not be your only option. One Pro Football Hall of Famer found out for himself. He actually canceled his own knee replacement after using the curve. Now, he's off pain meds, too, thanks to this incredible device. You really have to experience it. So you get the idea. Now, they are, although they're, they're not making specific medical claims, they're making some interesting claims as positioning this device to be an alternative to surgery and an alternative to medication. So those, you are, you are starting to get kind of, of interesting there. Well, what's the regulatory strategy? Remember, regulatory strategy is not the same as regulatory pathway. Oftentimes when I have a new customer come to me, uh, I'll ask them, what's your regulatory strategy? They'll say 510K or de novo or something like that. Well, that's your pathway to market. That's not your regulatory strategy. Those are not the same thing. One of the things that's going to influence the, uh, the decision here is your regulatory risk. Right In this particular context, what I mean is the risk of saying something and then in the future, FDA coming back and uh, knocking on your door and say, hey, you seem to be making some claims here. We don't remember you ever talking about these claims with us. What the heck is going on? And that's exactly what happened to this company here. They just got smacked with a, um, uh, a fine from the FTC, from the federal uh, Federal Trade Commission, not the FDA, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, to stop making claims that this particular device uh, treats chronic severe pain and associated inflammation. And as a result, they settled for $12 million. Apparently, this company, and I don't have an affiliation with this company, this is just publicly available information, they promote their device nationwide as a smart device that is clinically proven even though they lacked scientific evidence to support the claims. According to the FTC, they falsely claimed that uh, their device was approved by the FDA to diagnose and treat chronic severe pain and reduce inflammation. So uh, bottom line, both FDA as well as FTC are cracking down on these kinds of claims, uh, not just for wellness devices. This is actually not uh, marketed as a as a wellness device, um, uh, it's a class one attempt, but they still uh, were having some unsubstantiated claims here. Once, as I said a moment ago, you can say anything that you want as long as you can prove it. Apparently, these and, and maybe this company did have the evidence to prove it. If they did, they should have taken it to the FDA first. And as a result, this is a, a screenshot from the company's website just yesterday. It says we've temporarily suspended shipping of our particular medical device. So this is what can happen when you overplay your hand, as I like to describe it. For those of you that have heard me uh, on some of my podcasts with, with John Spear uh, uh, and Greenlight, uh, you know, I characterize the entire relationship between the company and the FDA as a poker game in every sense of the word. And just because somebody understands the rules of poker doesn't mean they're going to be a good poker player. It certainly doesn't mean they're going to win the game. I want to do everything that I can legal, of course. I don't want to be wearing any orange jumpsuits to win the game. And so coming back to this particular example, this is what I mean. This is a classic poker example of the company overplaying their hand and as a result getting smacked for it. Uh, it would have been totally uh, avoidable uh, if they would have taken it to the FDA first. Uh, and so how can we uh, avoid this? We can do it uh, in one of two ways. Very, very easy to avoid. To, to, to avoid. We have two options. Um, first of all, just remember, as I've talked about before, your claims are directly proportional to your class. So if your goal is to be a class one exempt device, 
which is what the willow curve is, then my advice is simple. Make weak medical claims. Don't say anything about treating, you know, inflammation or stuff like that. On the other hand, if you do want to make stronger claims, like treating inflammation, fine, no problem, no, no problem at all. Go up a class, in this case, go to class two. But in order to do that, now, of course, you're entering the 510K or the de novo universe, which means that you have to take that to the FDA to make sure that they agree with you. Most important, and I can't emphasize this point enough, regardless of what class you are, I don't care, class zero, class one, class two, class three, make sure that you can support your claims because FDA may be interested in your class. I know the subject of this webinar is class, but, FD, but the FTC, the, the Federal Trade Commission, could care less. If you cannot substantiate your claims, I don't care even if you're on a class three device, you're not going to be dealing just with the FDA, although you'll be dealing with them for sure for a class three, but you may also be dealing with the FTC as well. Um, something to think about. Okay, so let's continue on because we're almost to the point of getting to the, to the Q&A. I have a few more examples to share with you. Here's another example of uh, classification. Is a dental light a regulated medical device? And if so, what class? Well, the short answer is it depends. Jessica, you're right. Some of the folks in our audience have obviously heard me before. So what does it depend on? It depends on a number of things, including the indication. Uh, in other words, our claims, what we say. Here's when it gets interesting for when it comes to dental lights. If your indication is just simply to provide light, like a flashlight, to see what you're doing, or if your indication is for bleaching, in both of those cases, you are a class one exempt device, which means, yes, you still have to be uh, FDA registered, uh, QMS, dot, 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 but no 510K or de novo. On the other hand, exactly the same dental light, exactly the same. If your indication is for curing, now that light becomes a class two and a 510K or perhaps a de novo is required, even though the device itself, including the wavelength, is exactly the same, and wavelength here is just nothing more than a metaphor for dosage from the drug world, even though it's exactly the same. This is the scalpel all over again. You say about the scalpel, if you want to just cut you know, general tissue, it's class one. If you want to cut the eye, it's class three. This is exactly the same thing. If you want to use the dental light just as a general source of lighting, like a flashlight or bleaching, it's class one exempt. If it's specifically indicated for curing, it's class two, 510K or de novo. Um, and I said I was going to talk a tiny bit about classification outside the U.S. Here's a quick example of that. Uh, in this particular annex, now granted the new MDRs are going into effect in the EU, so things are changing a little bit. This is from the previous system, but nonetheless it makes an excellent point. You see here under Rule 12, uh, under the, the EU classification guidance, that dental curing lights are specifically listed as an example there. The question is why? Is it, to, to me, I find this tremendously instructive because please notice that it's not like they have a laundry list of lots of examples here and dental curing lights tends to be one or simply as one of them. No, that's not the case. They only have a couple of examples and in this particular case, dental curing lights are one of them. Could it be that it's purely coincidence that somebody just decided to list this as an example? Yeah, of course that's possible. But could it also be that there was a problem with dental curing lights in the past uh, and that's why it's in here? Absolutely. And this is when I would be picking up the phone and I would be calling my friends in the EU and say, hey, was there a problem with dental lights over there in, in the past that for some reason I don't know about? Because one of the things I pride up myself on is whenever I go to the FDA, I want to make darn sure that my reviewer friends on the FDA side of the table don't know anything that I, or that, in other words, they don't know something that I don't know. Because if they know something that I don't know, I'm at a tactical disadvantage and that's not a, uh, a way that I want to play this game. So I find this example particularly instructive as to why uh, that particular example is there. On the other hand, coming back to the U.S. system and the, two, the different uh, uh, CFR sections for the different applications of dental lights does kind of beg the question, maybe somebody has too much time on their hands, but I'll leave that as a, as a rhetorical comment. There is a device classification database. You can go to the FDA's website and type in the name of your device if you're working on an existing device to determine the, the classification. But remember, these databases can be used for many, many different things. One of 
the things that I like to use them for is competitive intelligence. This would be an off-label use of the, the classification database. And for those of you that are regulatory geeks, I hope you appreciate my not so subtle use of humor there. Um, but if you want to find out who, what other companies, what other devices are in your space, this is a very simple, very easy way to, to do that. Can classification be changed, and if so, by whom? Well, the short answer is yes, classification can absolutely be changed. Usually it's changed by the FDA, and periodically they do go through the universe of medical devices, and they will reclassify, sometimes upclassify, more often than not downclassify existing medical devices. But you as a manufacturer can also change your classification of your medical device, but you can't do so unilaterally. You can't just say, okay, we're changing from class three to class two. No, 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 you can't do that. But what you can do is you can take it out. I'll show you how in a second. You can take this to the FDA and say, in the past, our device was regulated as class three. We don't think it should be regulated as class three anymore. We think it should be class two, and here are all the reasons why. So you can change the classification as well. You just can't do it by yourself. And let me just talk just real briefly about down classification and especially up classification because the regulatory logic for down classification comes right out of the drug world. In other words, as the device is used more and more, as the as the technology becomes well established, as we have multiple devices and multiple um, companies using the same technology. We've got a good history of use. We've got a good understanding of the risks and benefits and so on. This is the exact same logic that we use in the drug world when a drug has been on the market for a while under the prescription and then it goes over the counter. So with enough history, we feel that it's appropriate to uh, offer that same drug, perhaps at a lower dosage, but nonetheless, the same drug at a, at a, at a, um, uh, over the counter. The same thing happens when FDA down classifies a medical device. The regulatory logic is exactly the same. When it comes to up classification, things are a little bit different. Um, usually what happens when, patient, when, when devices are up classified in automated external defibrillators, AEDs are a classic example of this, is they were brought onto the market as a lower class, say class two, but because maybe there were problems with the device, it was increased, it was elevated to class three. Breast implants are another example of that as well. Now, we can use this to our competitive advantage because we can, you know, have a medical device that's on the market as a class two, and we can go to the FDA and say, we want, we think it's more appropriate to have our device regulated as class three. Why? Because, yeah, you will be citing a higher regulatory burden for you, but who else will you be setting a higher regulatory burden for your competition? And so if you want to make it more difficult for your competitors to follow in your footsteps, one of the many ways that you can do that is if you're working on a class two device and you can make an honest argument, you can't say for competitive reasons, but you know, based on safety, for example, that it should be class three, you can take it to the FDA and try to sell it to them. Here's a quick example of a guidance. Um, FDA issues these kinds of guidances usually once a year or once every two years. Um, devices that have changed in classification since the previous guidance uh, has been issued. You can get those on FDA's website. For those of you that are interested in more, I did a uh, a, um, uh, a column in a, in a podcast on classification and specifically using it to your competitive advantage. This will be available to you in the handout, so uh, you'll get it when you get the, the handout. If you want to go to the FDA, as I mentioned a moment ago, and have your device reclassified, you can file what's called a reclassification petition. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of what you need to put in it, but bottom line, uh, all of this, everything that you see on this list is obvious. To me, it's, it's common sense. You need to be able to argue, let's say you want to go from class three to class two, you need to be able to argue that the device has been around for a long time, that it's well-established technology, that we have multiple devices with similar technologies, maybe with multiple manufacturers, we have a good understanding of safety, efficacy, long-term use and usability, and all those kinds of things. We put all of that together, and when the FDA considers what I call the totality of your evidence, if the evidence is strong enough to convince them that, yes, it makes sense to lower the classification to downclassify, then they will do it. Uh, but just remember, when you downclassify, just like what I said, when you upclassify, you, when you upclassify, you make it harder for your competition. When you downclassify, you make it easier for your competition. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. 
What if your device has not yet been classified? I mentioned uh, it, uh, earlier that most of you are working on existing devices where classification has already been determined. If you're working on a new device uh, where there isn't something out there, then this is an opportunity for you to um, uh, to, to uh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Then this is an opportunity for you to work with the FDA to um, uh, to determine the classification. And my favorite way to do that is with a de novo. For those of you that are familiar with the de novo, uh, I did a, a, a webinar on the de novo for Greenlight. I would encourage you to take a look at that. You can also do a 513G request or request for uh, classification. I rarely use the 513G. Occasionally, I'll use it, but most of the time, I strongly prefer a pre-submission meeting or a pre-sub because it gives me a lot more latitude than a 513G. Uh, for those of you that are not very familiar with the pre-submission process, uh, I've done a, a webinar for, for Greenlight on the pre-submission process. Very, very powerful way of making sure that uh, your device is not rejected by the FDA. Uh, so to wrap this up, because I know I want to allow some time for uh, for some Q and A and some discussion. <laughs> and if you haven't thought of any questions, uh, please do so and please type them into the box because we're going to be there in just a couple more minutes. Classification is never constant; it's always changing. Here's a quote, quote from Charles Dar Charles Darwin, who said, "It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survive. It's the one that is." A most adaptable to change. Regulation in general, classification in particular, they're changing all the time. Although I also am remember, reminded of the French philosopher who said the more things change, the more they remain the same. You know, we have a lot of things changing, and yet we still have lots and lots of problems. That's a, a topic, perhaps, of a, of a different discussion. So the last thing that I want to touch on very, very quickly is some differences in how classification varies around the globe. First and foremost, uh, don't compare numbers. I had one of my new customers uh, that I just talked to yesterday who was confused because he said that his particular device was class one. And I didn't know, you know why he was saying that. Well, it turned out that they've got a CE mark already for this device. It is class one in the EU, but it is not class one here. So just because something is, say, class two here in the U.S., doesn't necessarily mean that it's class two in uh, the EU or anywhere else. <clears throat> Remember, the classification systems, even though we use the, the same numbers, class one, class two, class three, they are fundamentally and also philosophically different. I don't have time to get into the details of compare and contrast between, say, classification for the U.S. versus EU, but it is not, it is not a transposable system. There is no convergence factor. Multiply your classification by a certain fudge factor in the U.S., and that'll give you the classification in the EU. I'm sorry, it's just not that simple. Um, <clears throat> there is a database for EU medical devices, sort of. I mentioned the classification database for the U.S. There is a similar database in the EU called Unimed. Unfortunately, and this has been around for a very long time, unfortunately, it's not publicly available. And don't even get me started about, about that. I've said so many times to the EU friends that it should be publicly available. Uh, I know they are, they have been for quite a while working on uh, making it publicly available. I don't know what the latest estimate is. I think maybe within the next year or so for making it publicly available. But with all due respect to my Euro European friends, this database should have been publicly available years, even decades ago. There's no reason why it's not publicly available today. Uh, so there is a database, but you probably don't have access to it. Classification in the EU is in many ways a more robust system, I think, than classification in the U.S. Because among other things, classification in the, Euro in the EU depends on the duration of patient contact, the degree of invasiveness, the operative mode of action, and the effect on the body. Now, I don't have time to get into these in more detail. Maybe in the future I'll do a webinar you know, specifically getting into the, the, the details here. But I, I really think that in, in, in many ways, the EU classification system, to me, never mind as a regulatory professional, but as a professional biomedical engineer, it makes a lot more sense than the, uh, than the system that we, we try to use here. But, um, but that's um, a topic of a different discussion. 
the last thing that I want to mention, this is an example of one of the flowcharts under the uh, the previous EU regulation, which is no longer in effect, granted, but uh, this was this flowchart was in effect for more than a decade. And what I want to point out to you is the top line here. Is the device invasive? No, it's not invasive. Therefore, it's automatically low risk in class one. Well, does anybody have a problem with that? I have a huge problem with that because so many people make the assumption that just because something is not invasive means that it's not risk, it's, it's, it's low risk. And in this particular case, class one. There are a number of examples of non-invasive medical devices that are uh, not low risk. I mentioned the automated external defibrillator a moment ago. That's an example of a device that's not invasive. Well, kind of it's invasive because it is passing electrical current into the patient. But other than that, it's not invasive, kind of like an x-ray machine. Some people think that an x-ray machine is non-invasive, but you are putting radiation into the patient. So what's your definition of invasive versus non-invasive? But my favorite example is an IVD, an in vitro diagnostic for cancer. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, IVDs are the fastest growing area of med the medical device industry. So if you have an IVD for cancer, uh, that particular device might not be used in the same room or even in the same building as the patient, but it is still at a very, very high risk. In other words, it gets into what I call the probability of providing the wrong information, false positives and false negatives. In other words, telling the patient they have cancer when in fact they do not, that would be a false positive. Or alternatively, telling the patient they do not have cancer when in fact they do, that would be a false negative. And that last reason why uh, a false negative is the reason why virtually all IVDs for cancer Virtually all of them, there are a couple of exceptions, but not many, are, are uh, class three PMAs. Even though it's totally non invasive, like I said, in some cases they're not even used in the same building, but um, uh, it's still a class three medical device. So reality is never as simple as some of these flowcharts will have people believe. And finally, if you want to determine your classification, either in the EU or in the US, believe it or not, there is an app for that. No, I'm not making this up. <laughs> this is an app that's being advertised. You can get it off of Google Play. Suffice it to say, you know, if you, you know, do you want to determine your, your class by uh, getting an app for that? You know, I don't know about you, but if I needed surgery, I would want it being done by a surgeon who, who learns to do surgery from an app. Just something to uh, to kind of to think about. So with that, we've covered an awful lot of information. I know in a pretty short period of time, I just want to wrap this up by reminding you that there are a lot of regulatory consultants out there, but there are not that many good ones. So how do you become a good one? Simple, learn when to follow, but more importantly, learn when to lead. If it's to my advantage to keep the same classification as a device before me, then I'll be the first one to do that. And I'll put the, that on my PowerPoint slide in 72 point font when I go into the FDA and say, you know, don't let the door hit you and you know what on the, on the way out. But if it's not to my advantage to follow the same classification or anything else for that matter that the people did before me, then I will be the first to go to the FDA and to work with them and say, hey, this is what the classification of this device was in the past, but it doesn't make sense, and here's what we think it should be, and here's why. Or this is a new device. It hasn't gone through the classification process i.e. a de novo, and therefore we think it should be a class two, and here's why, or a class one, and here's why, and so on. Because if you want to lead the orchestra, then you must first turn your back on the crowd. And unfortunately, that's not a common adage that uh, is practiced in our industry, and specifically in the regulatory field, very often. Here's one of my favorite quotes from Douglas MacArthur. <coughs> Don't just follow the rules. Think rules are mostly meant to be broken, and are too <clears throat> excuse me too often for the lazy to hide behind. Now, please don't miss my message here. I'm not saying that rules are not important. I'm not saying that you shouldn't follow the rules. I'm certainly not advocating anarchy. <clears throat> On the contrary, what I'm saying is very simple. If the rules make sense, then by all means follow them. But if the rules don't make sense, and we follow them anyway, and we all admit that they, we don't, they don't make sense, and we still follow them anyway. Is that a problem with the system, or is that a problem with us? As a regulatory professional and also as a, as a biomedical engineer, <clears throat> I'm constantly reading rules that uh, make absolutely no sense, 
and yet people follow them. And, they, and, and, and so it's, it's, it's nuts. And the very last thought that I want to share, and then uh, Jessica, we can open this up for some Q&A. Uh, uh, if you can think it, we can do it. Einstein, very smart guy, Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. For all knowledge points to all there is, imagination points to all there can be. What's wrong with applying a little imagination to regulation and to classification? You know, I started out in this business almost 30 years ago as an R&D engineer. And in R&D, people are supposed to be encouraged to think creatively, to think uh, imaginatively, to think outside the box. But in regulatory and in quality, too, that doesn't seem to happen very much. I take that creative, that outside-the-box thinking that I developed as an R&D engineer, and I apply it every single day to, uh, to the regulatory world. And Einstein, and again, very smart guy, I'm you know, much smarter than me, Einstein said that logic will get you from A to B, but imagination can take you anywhere. So at this point, I want to uh, uh, stop and thank everybody for uh, attending. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you learned a little something along the way. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. You have my phone and email and so on. Uh, happy to help however I can. But once again, thank you to, to Jessica and to all of the, the folks at Greenlight for the opportunity to conduct this webinar, not just today's webinar, but all of the, the webinars that I've alluded to that I've done in the past and looking forward to doing even more in the future. So at this point, Jessica, why don't we, uh, I'll turn it over to you. And if we have questions for the audience, from the audience, I'll, I'll be happy to try to discuss them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for going through and, and presenting on this. Um, believe it or not, guys, this is our first webinar that we have done on understanding the medical device classification system. Uh, Mike, we will definitely be taking you up on your offer to uh, present again on this topic in the future. A um, couple of housekeeping things. Yes, uh, a copy of this will be shared with anyone who registered, so you'll automatically get an email with it. It was recorded. Um, so you will get that as well as the, the handouts that Mike mentioned, uh, you'll have access to this. And if you have any further questions, his contact information is there for you to get in touch with him. Now, Mike, I think you are going to really appreciate uh, a few of these questions. Uh, they're Fire along away. the lines, uh, I, I think, of uh, where you are thinking. So um, one person is questioning. So we're, we're trying to potentially make this harder for those who follow behind <laughs> us. Um, if your device is up classified, do you have to provide more evidence to continue selling it? Uh, or is that class two clearance that you receive still adequate? Yeah, that's a terrific question, Jessica. And uh, thank you very much for whoever it is that asked that. Uh, once again, the short answer is it depends. There are a couple of examples that you might want to take a look at for for precedent in this area. One of them being uh, the breast implants and the other being the automated external defibrillators. But the short answer is for any new versions of the product or new new products in that same sort of category, they are going to be subject to the increased regulatory uh, burden. So if you're going from class two uh, and now you're a class three, if you're bringing a new device onto the market, you're going to be expected to meet the class three requirements, probably a PMA or maybe an HDE. When it comes to the devices that are already on the market, in most cases, those are kind of grandfathered in, kind of like in 1976 when FDA uh, originally started regulating medical devices. All the devices that were on the market prior to 1976, they weren't required to be taken off the market. Instead, they were sort of grandfathered in, if you will. Now, that is what usually happens, but there are exceptions. If there's a particular problem with a device, then before FDA comes knocking on your door, I would go to them prophylactically and have a discussion. Hey, we understand that the category of our device has now been unclassified, but we have, you know, an existing device that was on the market, you know, as a class two or something like that. Let's have a discussion as to what, you know, uh, how do we best manage that? Uh, do we need to do some additional testing to show you that these problems can't happen to us? Maybe they've happened to other people. So that would be the gray area, Jessica, um, uh, if there's a problem. Is there anything that you can think of, Jessica, that you would add? No, and I, I think that that's really the big thing to keep in mind is that it really does. Uh, this is probably my favorite answer is always, it depends. Um, you know, <laughs> as you've alluded to and, and expanded on so many times, um, you know, the the rules 
are there and when you understand them and you are um, you know very clear cut uh, that's one thing but uh, as we both know it's it's very rarely uh, clear cut yeah I can't think of one situation uh, that I've ever been in in almost 30 years Jessica where it has been to use your phrase clear cut <laughs> but yeah. but anyway your point is well taken um, so a couple of other um, good questions in here. Um, so uh, as far as going through all of this, um, one person uh, is asking, um, you know, hey, US, Europe, probably other areas of the world have their own systems uh, to group the different types of medical devices. Um, you know, obviously there's the global medical device nomenclature that they were talking about for some of these different definitions. Um, is there a standard system used worldwide or a method to help cross-link the different systems for classification? Good question. Uh, the short answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, it would be nice if we had a sort of a, a global classification system where we wouldn't have to worry about my device is class X in one place and class Y in another place, even though the device itself is exactly the same. This Jessica, I would say, falls under the general discussion of, um, 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 oh my gosh, I just thought of, I just forgot the, the phrase. Uh, um, what do you call it? We, uh, oh, global harmonization. Yeah. Uh, global harmonization. Yeah, where we would like to, you know, have a, uh, you know, the same regulatory uh, system around the globe. In other words, why does it make sense to have to jump through a different set of hoops? just simply as a function of what part of the earth you happen to be standing on at the time. You know, in many ways, that just doesn't make any sense. But this is a topic of a different discussion, Jessica. I just don't think that's going to happen anytime soon for, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. We can't even agree on a global currency, so how could we agree on a global regulatory system? Uh, but again, regrettably, there is no single classification standard, at least that I'm aware of. Jessica, you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. um, that applies across the globe. So uh, we did want uh, one of our um, listeners in here uh, has shared, uh, just as a reminder, that uh, IVD uh, does indeed have in Europe a different classification system uh, versus uh, the medical devices. So some of the things from an IVD standpoint can be class 1, class 2A, or class 2B for non-invasive. That is correct, especially under the newer rules. Thank you for pointing that out. However, I know, and I had some customers that I said, no, I won't work them be with them because of this. They had IVDs on the market, or, or no, sorry, let me start again. They wanted to put IVDs on the market in the EU for high-risk situations before the, um, the, the classification requirements for IVDs had changed. And, uh, you know, so that's a clear advantage, a clear example of taking advantage of the system. Uh, look, and again, I appreciate the point that the, that, that person was, was just making. I, I, I agree with the point. But here's what it comes down to. Uh, the regulation, you know, the classification is not nearly as important as the biology and the engineering. In other words, for any of you in our, in our audience who have heard me talk in our podcasts or other webinars, to me, everything has to begin with the biology and the, and the engineering first, not the regulation. The regulation should come to come come later. In other words, if somebody can convince me that the that the engineering is sound and that the biology, the pathophysiology is sound, then don't worry. I'll make the regulation work. That's not a problem. But if the engineering is not sound or if the biology is not sound, then we've got fundamental problems that are, you know, much more important than the the regulation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and that's something where, you know, we always want to uh, use our brains to go through and, and think about these things and make sure that, you know, we are doing what is right uh, and what is the, the best path regardless of whether it is the most popular one or not. Um, so yeah. uh, a couple of questions around some of the class zero or the wellness devices. Is it a manufacturer's or FDA's responsibility to determine that classification? Great question. And again, let me be crystal clear. So that phrase class zero is not something that FDA or specifically CDRH uses. CDR uses class zero in the drug world, but we won't go there. Uh, but the short answer is it's totally up to the manufacturer to make that determination as to whether their device is what I call a legitimate wellness device or a class zero device. 
and I have no problem with that. I do, uh, as some in our audience know, Jessica, I do a lot of work with wellness devices. Here's the problem that I have. And I have made this suggestion so many times to the FDA, I'm getting tired of making it. We have no mechanism in place where a company can take what they think is a legitimate wellness device and present it to the FDA prophylactically to make sure that FDA sees it the same way. We have no mechanism, no pre-sub, no form, no nothing that we can use to do that. And believe me, I have tried to do that in many ways using the RFD, using the pre-sub, using even a device determination, uh, and it has just not been successful. But FDA has no problem going back and smacking companies for bringing a device onto the market under the wellness exemption that is not, in fact, a legitimate wellness device. So we really need to create a mechanism, and I know many of my FDA friends listen to our podcast and our webinars, uh, please listen. We need a mechanism in place that legitimate companies can go to the FDA before there's any problems to make sure that everybody sees it the same way. I don't think that's an unreasonable ask, uh, but regrettably, um, in, the, in the last three or four years since FDA has, has issued the wellness device exemption guidance, uh, no such mechanism has been, has, has been created. Yeah, uh, and that is something, uh, you know, that uh, it is important for us to understand uh, that, that the mechanisms that currently exist and, and where we would like to. A um, couple of questions around that in terms of, you know, what happens if you misclassify your medical device? Um, so, you know, what happens if you either A, classify it uh, too high, so, you know, you think maybe it's a, a class two and really it's a class one, um, or what if it's really not a medical device but you classify it as one? So two good questions. Let's let's talk about them separately. The first is if you misclassify, I'm going to make the assumption that this is an existing device, okay? Because if it's a new device, then that's a different that's a different discussion. If it's an existing device, if you go to the FDA, you think your device is class two, and therefore you are going to submit a 510k or maybe a de novo. In that case, FDA is probably going to say, why the heck are you wasting our time, you know, with a 510k or de novo? This to us looks like a class one exempt. But to be honest with you, Jessica, I would be so embarrassed if that happened because that would be clear evidence that I didn't know what the heck I was doing, that I wasn't doing my, my job. Uh, so, um, but I've seen it happen where I, I had somebody come up to me once uh, after doing a, a, a presentation at a conference. Apparently, her company submitted a device as a class three as a PMA. FDA came back and said, no, you didn't have to do this as a PMA. You could have done it as a class two as a de novo. And I said to her in that particular case, well, first of all, you're lucky because FDA didn't have to tell you that. You know, that's, you know, that's your job, not FDA's job. But I would, in that case, go back to the FDA and say, say, thanks for your recommendation, but we want to keep it as a PMA because they've done all the work anyway. Why? Not for regulatory reasons, but for competitive reasons. So uh, so, so that's the, the first part of the question. Mm -hmm. The second part of the question, I think, was if it was not a regulated medical device at all. Is that Was that the... the yeah, gist? what happens if, uh, you know, you classify it as a medical device and it turns out that it's not? So I think the same thing is going to happen if you classify it as a medical device and you try to go through either the registration process or the clearance or approval process, FDA is going to probably come back and say, hey, this doesn't seem like a regulated device to us. Uh, you know, don't waste our time. But I would like to think, Jessica, that that would be, um, that that would be found out long in advance, uh, as, as many in our audience know, I'm a huge fan of the pre-submission process. So I will bring that up as a, as a, as a pre-sub, um, which can be done. I've done it with certain kinds of pre-subs before, uh, but this goes back to what I said a moment ago with the wellness devices. There's really no formal mechanism in place where we can take that um, uh, non-regulated medical device to the FDA to make sure that FDA also sees it as not regulated. And as simply as I can, and again, I'll just remind everybody that I did the webinar for Greenlight on, on, on wellness devices, so take a look. But when we talk about a regulated medical device, simply put, what that means is it fits the CFR definition of a medical device. The CFR definition of a medical device is many paragraphs long. Most of it is a bunch of you know what. But the, the important part Part of the definition in essence is that a medical device is something other than a drug 
that is intended to prevent, diagnose, or disease, or sorry, prevent, diagnose, or, or treat a disease, injury, or condition. So let me say that one more time. The essence of the definition of a medical device is something other than a drug that's intended to prevent, diagnose, or treat a disease, injury, or condition. So if you prevent, diagnose, or treat a disease, injury, or condition, you are probably a regulated medical device. I don't care if it's a piece of software, if it's a heart valve, it's an IVD, whatever it is. You are probably a regulator, regulated medical device. Alternatively, if you don't uh, prevent, diagnose, or treat, a disease, injury, or condition, then most likely you are not regulated as a medical device. You can call it a wellness device, you can call it a consumer product, I don't care what you call it, but you're not a regulated medical device. That's as simple as I can try to explain it without oversimplifying. Mm -hmm.